Hello, busy, 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 busy week this week. Um, we've got real finances. We've got Harry and Meghan arguing with the President of the United States. We've got uh, news of a new royal baby on the way. You know, a good spread, really, isn't it? Good spread and the royal finances. Oh, the, bit of climate the, change. The day that we always have to put on our <laughs> maths hats and uh, try and work out what they've been spending. You've got to do the math, which is what we had to do. Um, so did. why don't, as we've got so much to get through, let's um, go straight to the Robinsons Royal Rundown and then we can go through some of the math that we've been doing with the various households about how they've been spending our slash your slash UK money. So as you've teed up, uh, yeah, we found out uh, Royal Finances this week, what they have all been spending over the last year and uh, projected uh, forecasts for the next few years and how they've been impacted by coronavirus. Harry and Meghan uh, took part in a video this week that was about encouraging Americans to vote in the upcoming election. And uh, that video ended up being incredibly controversial for a number of reasons that we can talk about. Uh, Prince Charles has been warning this week about climate change um, and he says that it will dwarf the impact of coronavirus. He made a speech this week to mark Climate Week. The Duchess of Cambridge um, had a visit to Battersea Park in London and she was there uh, learning about parent-to-parent -parent support groups and how they've been impacted by coronavirus. Some lovely news today, uh, Princess Eugenie and her husband Jack Brooksbank have announced that they are expecting a baby in early 2021. And finally, uh, the Duchess of Sussex's uh, court case with the Mail on Sunday, which is about the letter that she wrote to her father, uh, there was a hearing for that early in the week. Right, OK, a long hearing. I was in it. Um, <laughs> it went on all day long um, and we can tell you all about it. So uh, lots of things to get through. Um, I've got some specs to help me through some eye issues I've currently got going, but I need the specs so I can read all these sort of details about kind of royal reports and travelling uh, and all the rest of it. Um, a lot to discuss. The, the thing with this, uh, the Sovereign Grant this time was that there wasn't one story. Last year, you remember, it was the 2.4 million because it was item one of the capital spending was on Frogmore Cottage. Kind of got a bit of that to talk about. Um, we've got to talk about the Queen's hit to her finance by coronavirus. We've got uh, why did Prince on. Andrew not get a scheduled plane to another part of the UK? Why did Princess Anne not get a scheduled plane to Rome? I mean, there's a lot to talk about. And uh, topping the royal travel bill for last year was Harry and Meghan's tour to mm. Africa, which was actually happening at this time last year, which we have been reminiscing a lot about the fact that last year we were off on a yes. great uh, autumn tour and um, tour. Uh, this um, year we're not. And actually, I, I don't quite see why that is so controversial because it cost uh, Harry and Meghan's tour, which lasted, what, sort of five or six days? Eight, and, eight, eight oh, no, days. It started on a Monday, <laughs> went on to the following Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. Yeah, so we're talking like, you know, nine, ten days. It cost £245,643. Um, not million, as I accidentally said in our lunchtime bulletin. So I think I will take this opportunity to correct it here, as we did on TV. It's not 245 million, as I incorrectly said. Um, it's 245,000 um, pounds. And we corrected that on air. But actually, as I say, this day last year, um, Meghan was taking Archie to see Desmond Tutu. Yeah, Harry and Meghan. Um, um, the only time we saw uh, baby Archie on the trip was... Uh was on this day last yeah, year when right. uh, when they went to see Desmond Tutu. And then, um, like on Wednesday when we were in the office, we were talking about how we were in the anger when yep. Megan was doing that dancing and she gave that quite powerful speech saying that, that really so, you know, as, as your sister, as a woman of colour and all the rest of it, how things have changed over a year. We're slightly digressing from the <laughs> uh, Sovereign Grant report. We will obviously go through it. Um, should we talk about... So, I think we can park Harry and Meghan's thing. Uh, actually, while we're on Harry and Meghan and the, the Sovereign Crown Report, <laughs> shall we just say it's been cleared up by the palace. They paid the £2.4 million, as we've discussed on this podcast before, uh, and they've paid rent for a number of years going forward. Yeah, they've paid what seems to be a lump sum of money, and that lump sum covers the £2.4 million, that controversial figure, for the refurbishment work to yeah. Frogmore that needed doing, but it also covers 
uh, the rent that they've also agreed to pay in keeping Frogmore as their official UK residence. Uh, and that rent uh, covers an unspecified amount of time. So we don't know how long yes. they've paid uh, up front for. But this all comes off the back of this huge Netflix deal that they had done. Yes, they've got obviously got the money to do it. But actually, to quote the royal source, you said Frogmore will be Harry and Meghan's UK private residence, quotes for the foreseeable future. Yeah. So let's start with Harry Meghan and, and uh, this sovereign grant report. Let's talk about how coronavirus has affected it because the Queen is taking a hit from coronavirus in a number of ways. We just need to sort of run through with you uh, what ways it has been hit. First of all, let's talk about um, going forwards because the sovereign grant is calculated as a sort of chunk, 25% of the profits of the Crown Estate, those profits clearly, like everything else in the economy at the moment, are going down. So in two years' time, they're going to get a smaller sovereign grant, or should get a smaller sovereign grant. Should get a smaller sovereign grant, but the way the sovereign grant is worked out is that it can go up, but it cannot go down. So it can, be, <laughs> it can be held at the, uh, the existing yes. level, yes. which would be in... Uh, Two years' time would be eighty-six point yeah. three million pounds. Eighty-six point three. I have to be frozen. They haven't quite done the calculations for this year, but they know because of everything else going on in the economy, not just here but everywhere around the world. Um, they know the profits are going to go down. So therefore, in two years' time, the sovereign grant is going to be affected uh, by uh, coronavirus. There's a more immediate hit, however. Um, let's just do the immediate hit. These are the tickets that uh, people buy in order to go to Windsor Castle, Buckingham Palace, the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. So um, people aren't going. Uh, in addition to the money that they get from the uh, sovereign grant, they have supplementary income from uh, the Royal Collection Trust. And the Royal Collection Trust has been badly hit by the coronavirus pandemic because they've had to close lots of their sites um, to visitors and they've taken a huge hit. And so because of that hit to income, they are predicting uh, over the course of three years, a £15 million decrease in income that the uh, the royal family would receive. Yeah, effectively, because of fewer tourists, fewer visitors, not just in London, but Windsor, Edinburgh as well, that they are going to have £5 million less each year for three years. So there's another £15 million the Queen's going to be hit by. And the third area, this is what we know of at the moment, that coronavirus is affecting the Queen's finances, is that the resurfacing programme for Buckingham Palace, which is a 10-year-long programme, uh, is going to, was projected to cost, or, or at least they would get £369 million towards the costs, they now think because of coronavirus, they're only going to get 349 million. So they said at least a 20 million pound hit and they've got to find it through savings, budgeting, whatever else. Yeah. So and that's because the, the sovereign grant is not going up at the rate that they were expecting. Yes. Um, they uh, they will come in 20 million pounds short. But they are seven. It's a, a 10 year programme. They're three <laughs> years in. So they do have seven years left. They kind of say to try and find some savings. And one of the interesting things they said to us, whilst there was a pause in the work for about six weeks, they said, didn't they? But they've actually because people are working from home and therefore Buckingham Palace's offices are less busy. They've actually been able to sort of speed up work in other areas. Yeah. And the, because the palace is effectively they, they can open up more areas that yeah. they can get into to work so they have been able to do that at least right but, um and they have said that they will you know recoup this will find this 20 million through efficiencies and efforts so um they will they will try and find the money right so we've done africa tour we've done frogmore cottage we've done coronavirus hitting the royal finances yep. let's do travel because travel is always a very interesting one and um in the travel pages here um, I've circled a few of them. I don't know where to start. Do we do Royal Train or should we do Prince Andrew? Let's do Prince Andrew, shall we? Um, Andrew. We all know that Prince Andrew is no longer a working member of the royal family because of what happened, uh, well, the ongoing situation with him and his former friendship with Jeffrey Epstein. However, I mean, in the travel documents here, um, the, the, the pages are numerous, but I've circled one that said the Duke of York. Then it says method of travel charter Date was the 18th of July. Um, basically, he chartered a plane to fly to Northern Ireland. Yeah, and that was to attend the Royal Portrush Golf Club's Open Championship. And the amount that cost, that private jet, was £15,848, which is a eye-watering amount of money for well, a flight to a return flight, flight, return flight really. I mean, to if Ireland. I spent £15,000 on a return flight, I'd spend <laughs> um, quite a lot of money for it. Uh, however... I mean, we asked the palace about this, as you would expect. We said, 
the, they, their explanation for why members of the royal family get chartered planes is because of the type of job, uh, do they have any notice, what's their timetable, are there any alternatives? And I kind of, we asked that question, well, what was so busy in Prince Andrew's schedule at the time that he couldn't just get a flight from London to Belfast? Uh, what timetable constraints did he have at that point for an event that he must have known was coming up. It wasn't sprung on him on the day before. He must have known this was in his diary for months. Yeah, the source said that they concluded that the use of charter was the only way to get him to complete his engagements to fit in with his other programmes. Right, well, whatever his other programmes were, it's ended up costing the Sovereign Grant uh, £15,800 for a flight. And really on a similar vein, um, and you can kind of explain the diary issues more clearly with the, with the Princess Anne, with the Princess Royal, <laughs> but she also um, chartered a plane to go to Rome. This is a flight from London to Rome, a charter plane, here we are, I've circled it again, the Princess Royal. This was on the 22nd of February uh, to attend a rugby match there as patron, because she's patron of the Scottish Rugby Union. Again, I, I don't think any of us really got an explanation. I know she has a busy diary, but why she couldn't have just hopped on a plane from London to Rome. There's lots of them. Yeah, £16,440 for that one. So, that charter. Um, again, I will stream. But yes, they, they do take into consideration, as you say, their programmes, efficiency, uh, security, all sorts of um, measures. But um, for, for destinations like Rome and Northern Ireland, you know, the question was raised that there are a lot of commercial flights going every day at a... A fraction of the price of these. Yes, and uh, what we know from the, the documentary that uh, Princess Anne did for ITV um, for her 70th birthday, just what, last month or the month before, uh, she is a very busy person. Yeah, her pr diary is often Royal the busiest does. of all the royal families, but surely you could shove something up or down the diary in order to save £16,000, one would have thought. But um, um, I mean, the other interesting thing on this travel thing uh, um, was, I'll come on to the Royal Train in a minute, but I mean, Prince Charles had to go, had to fly to Muscat at short notice to attend uh, the funeral of the Sultan there. Now, the cost of that was £210,000. Now, I... I get the fact he needed a charter because it was very short notice. Very short notice, yeah. Um, he was asked to go by the government. He only had like a day's notice or whatever. Uh, it does seem, you know, it, it, people in the newspapers have given Harry and Meghan a hard time for 250000 Prince Charles spent 210000 just getting from Aberdeen to Muscat to Marham Airport, which is just outside London. I mean, just going back to Harry and Meghan, I know he sort of said we'd park that, but I think the reason that Harry and Meghan potentially have been given a hard time for that huge figure for their tour is that they quit as working members of the royal family just three months later so you know they were they were working royals at the time but three months later they they had mm. left so I think that's potentially why they've but they did the work had, I mean they did the work uh, yeah, and as we you know, know we went to all four countries with Harry it was really hard work and not cheap because we paid our own way. Um, there was an ITV news team on it. There was a documentary team for ITV as well. We know how expensive this thing was. Uh, I just I just still struggle to see how Prince Charles's return trip to um, Muscat can cost £210,000. Yes, so, a, um, a lot of there money. We go. Uh, the final thing we're going to do on, on these finances is on, on the Royal Train. The Royal Train, um, It yeah. comes up every year, the Royal Train, which is kept for the use of the Royal Family. I mean, there's... I mean, the Queen's 94, and they have often said to us before, it's actually very useful for the Queen to be able to get on the train, sleep on the train, get off the train, have a full day of engagements, etc. But it's not cheap, is it? It's not cheap. And um, in the period of 2019 to 2020 that the Sovereign Grant looks at, only three trips were taken on the train, and the total cost of those was more than £63,000. Mm. So roughly like £20,000 a trip. Yeah. Again... We're talking a lot of money to get a train from, I think Prince Charles went to uh, in South Wales, he went to the Lake District and the Queen went to Scotland on London it. London to Edinburgh um, for, for Royal Week, yeah. I mean, I've got the train from London to Edinburgh. Never have I spent £20,000 on the train ticket. <laughs> the sleeper train. <laughs> <laughs> well, even then, I mean, actually, I looked at getting the sleeper train to Scotland in the summer. I didn't in the end, but it was... Five hundred pounds or something to go there. I'm not sure we could put the Queen wasn't, on the uh, sleeper train to it wasn't Scotland. Twenty thousand. <laughs> uh, anyway, so so there was our day of looking at royal finances. I mean, also um, there is a video that uh, Clarence House has put up of um, Charles and Camilla's annual year. They did five hundred and eighty engagements in ninety yeah. towns. Uh, we know how busy Prince Charles is, so they made a little video of the whole thing, which is on YouTube. Have a little uh, listen. The 2020 Clarence House Annual Review covers an extraordinary period, quite unlike any other we have seen before. In 
It was a busy year, with their Royal Highnesses visiting communities up and down the country and overseas. They saw at first hand new developments in technology and innovation, the changing face of the high street, as well as many other aspects of national life, including our rich cultural heritage, even taking part in some performances themselves along the way. So before we wrap up on the uh, Sovereign Grant, we asked a royal finance expert, Sir David McClure, who's also uh, written a book about the Queen's finances. Has yet the Queen's true worth. And the Queen's he... true worth. Um, what he thought about the figures. This is a politically sensitive time. You know, it's quite interesting that the palace did say today that they didn't want any extra funding. And I'm sure they're very well aware that if they went to the government with their begging bowl and said, give us some more, more money, there would be a public outroar. But that means they've got to find the savings, either through making staff redundant or just cutting costs. Well, yes, there's only two ways to deal with this problem. Cut costs or raise revenue. If they raise revenue, that will mean more taxpayers' money going to the palace and that will provoke a public outcry. And to be clear, we're talking about the sovereign grant for the uh, past year. It, it actually, the report was delayed because of coronavirus, but actually the impact on, on palace finances is likely to be much more severe when we get next year's report. Yeah, the, uh, the report goes up to the 31st of March, so it really is sort of um, not massively going to have been impacted by coronavirus and lots of what we're uh, saying is sort of forecast yes. for the uh, the difficulties in terms of yeah, finances ahead yeah, yeah they exactly. do and um, they did that you know we spoke a, a lot about how uh, all members of the royal family over the recent months have adapted so quickly to a different way of working to stay visible even yes. though they're not able to be out and about um, as yes. much as they usually are and actually, whilst uh, we're here, because actually I, I've noticed some criticism on my Twitter that we haven't we haven't noted the cost of the Pakistan trip for um, William and Kate, and I just need that to was a hundred and seventeen thousand one hundred and sixteen pounds. Again, because they also used the they used the uh, yeah, RF Voyager, Voyager that we uh, we, we went on with them trip. for a slightly bumpy ride for one of those. Yes, trips, if, you if you remember, we were yep. yes in one of these podcasts we were talking about um, how we that <laughs> nearly crashed. Terrifying. Um, yeah, one hundred seventeen thousand pounds for the official foreign office trip to Pakistan on the fourteenth to eighteenth of October last year. Right, Royal Finance is done. Let's do. Oof, that's let's it for another year. Well, let's see, uh, Donald Trump. Um, so we start, let's, let's do the story backwards. Let's listen to what Donald Trump said when he was asked, I should um, couch this by saying when he was asked erroneously by a reporter uh, about Meghan and Harry urging people to vote for Joe Biden, which they didn't, but have a listen to this whole clip. I'm not a fan of hers. And uh, I would say this, and she probably has heard that, but uh, I wish a lot of luck to Harry, because he's going to need it. Wow. I mean, <laughs> uh, I don't know quite what to make of that. Let's start from the beginning. So this reporter apparently was from the, the, the works for the Daily Mail in the US. I don't know for sure, but this is what I've been told by uh, Team Sussex, that um, she asked ha Mr. Trump whether Harry and Meghan had uh, urged people to vote for Joe Biden. In actual fact, what they did in a video, which we'll play you in a minute, was just encourage people to vote because it was National Registration Day in America. It was, and this is not the first time we've heard uh, Meghan uh, encouraging Americans to get out and uh, use their vote. But this time she was joined by the Duke of Sussex. And uh, in that speech, uh, Meghan speech, that video, Meghan was talking about how, you know, every year we say... Every vote, four years. Every we're four told, year yeah. we're told, you know, this election is the most important, get out there and vote. But this one really is the most important. And then Harry talks about how vital it is that we reject hate speech, misinformation and online negativity. So they don't say explicitly what they're talking about, but I think you can read between the lines about uh, potentially what they could be saying. Every four years, we are told the same thing, that this is the most important election of our lifetime. But this one is. When we vote, our values are put into action and our voices are heard. Your voice is a reminder that you matter because you do and you deserve to be heard. This election, I'm not going to be able to vote here in the US. But many of you may not know that I haven't been able to vote in the UK my entire life. As we approach this November 
it's vital that we reject hate speech, misinformation and online negativity. So there we are. I mean, I suppose that's, again, the difficulty. Had Meghan just spoken about the US election, there would be none of this controversy. But um, Buckingham Palace actually had to put out a statement, didn't they, to say that Harry was speaking in his personal capacity because they were so concerned, perhaps, about um, Harry's words about the election. Yeah, the, the palace spokesman said that they would not comment, but the Duke is not a working member of the royal family and any comments he makes are made in a personal capacity. So putting some distance there between... Uh, them yeah, and, him. and the distance is already there because they've left the royal family. But they um, have. but nevertheless, he's still the queen's uh, grandson and sixth in line to yes. the throne, despite yes. stepping down. And actually, um, you know, we still deal with uh, Team Sussex's offices, uh, and they speak to us all the time. And uh, I think their analysis of this was just Prince Harry saying this is likely to be a very fractious debate in the run-up to the election from everything we've seen between the two sides in the U.S. Uh, and Harry was just basically telling people to try and be a bit less negative or not take so much notice of the negativity online. No, he was not urging people to vote for either Joe Biden or uh, Donald Trump. No, but I think, as we said in your, you said in your piece the other night, you know, I think if you look at both the candidates, there is one more than another that uh, perhaps... Which one is more negative? Which yeah. one is more negative or... Uh, online, you know, that you, you could read into it that he was talking about Donald Trump. And, you know, the Queen is politically neutral, members of the family. She's got 68 years practice of being politically yep. neutral. And uh, members of her really family do not vote, become involved in politics or elections. And while we know about Meghan's views on politics, yeah. she'd made those views clear before well, she is, married into yeah. the family. You know, for Harry to join her, that that seems to be what's caused quite so much controversy. Funny you should say that. Funny We've I should got, say that. <laughs> uh, Megan's views. These, Almost these like I views. set that up. <laughs> yeah. These are the views that Megan gave in 2016. Let's be clear, before she married Prince Harry, before she became a member of the royal family, these are the views she gave in 2016 to a late night chat show in the US on a channel called uh, Comedy Central. And this is what she said about Donald Trump. With as misogynistic as Trump is and so vocal about it, right. that's a huge chunk of it. You're not just voting for a woman mm -hmm. if it's Hillary just because she's a woman, but certainly because Trump has made it easy to see that you don't really want right. that kind of world that he's painting. But so not uncontroversial and nor, 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 nor is the court case that Meghan is taking against the Mail on Sunday. We've been through this many times. I think we'll just give you a very brief summary of what happened in court on Monday. I was sat through it all and listened to it, but uh, we're still in the pre-trial hearing. We're not yet at um, a trial, but they were talking about how much this is costing both sides. One, three million pounds. I think 1.8 for Meghan's side, 1.2 for the Mail on Sunday sides. None of it's very cheap. None of this The only is people cheap. gaining out of this are the lawyers and, yeah. and, and their bank accounts. And their bank accounts. I mean, and like you say, this hasn't even gone to trial yet. This is still arguing about what makes it to the mm. trial and what can be heard. And this uh, hearing centred on uh, Finding Freedom, the new book yes. by uh, Omid Scobie and Carolyn Durand. How best to sum up, basically, is that the Mail on Sunday wants to change its defence since this book has come out, basically saying that Meghan and Harry, co this is their uh, argument, by the way, not mine, uh, that Meghan and Harry cooperated with the authors of the book, Omid Scobie and Carolyn Durand, and therefore allowed very, very personal details of her life to be put into the public domain, which they think has a bearing on their defence for publishing Meghan's letter to her father. Is that an accurate summary? I think so, but... Um... Megan's legal team, one of the witness statements and a lot of the argument is putting a lot of distance between uh, Megan and this book and the involvement. Yes, so there was they didn't a, get involved, they didn't give an interview, they didn't authorise it and all this. That was repeated again and again and in this witness statement uh, there were, I mean I counted up at one point how many times they talk about the creative licence of the book, the inaccuracies, the information that was taken that was already in the public domain. They're really trying to put mm. some water between them and the book in terms of, uh, you know, the questions over how much Meghan was involved. And, and highlighting as well, actually, that the, the, the book claimed that Meghan had gone to a place in, was it Botswana, mm -hmm. and yet she'd never actually been there. Yeah. So actually pointing out some inaccuracies in the book to try and prove that actually Meghan didn't cooperate with the authors, Omid and Carolyn. Yeah, and there was a list of things that you know, that they had found that were already out in the public domain, things taken from her um, TIG website, for example, mm. that doesn't exist anymore. So, um, And actually saying that some of the some of the stuff in the book um, were actually taken 
the, the, the um, information, the source, was the Mail on Sunday itself, particularly when they were talking about the, yeah. the, the letter. So that rolls on. We still don't have a decision on whether the Mail is allowed to do that or not, but the, um, the judge uh, will come back to us and let us know. And we will, of course, let you know uh, on this podcast. Shall we move on to Duchess of Cambridge? Duchess of Cambridge, yep. Um, so in Battersea Park, doing um, a, a, a subject very close to her heart, which is um, helping young mothers and, and getting other young mo mothers to support young mothers. Yeah, learning about peer support groups and uh, how you know parent to parent support um, and how some of these or how all of these networks have been affected by uh, the pandemic. You know, lots of them meet up and um, have been un unable to do so uh, during coronavirus. Now, um, let's talk about, I'm trying to think of a good segue, but there isn't. Let's talk about Kate's father-in-law, shall we? Let's um, talk about Kate's father-in-law, because this father was a really um, um, important have a speech. Listen to what Kate's father-in-law said. This is Prince Charles, in case you haven't twigged already. <laughs> this is what he said to a climate conference, the only international climate conference actually happening this year because of coronavirus. But this is what he said to the virtual opening of this climate conference, which is called Climate Week NYC. The borderless climate biodiversity and health crises are all symptoms of a planet that has been pushed beyond its planetary boundaries. Without swift and immediate action at an unprecedented pace and scale, we will miss the window of opportunity to reset for a green-blue recovery and a more sustainable and inclusive future. In other words, the global pandemic is a wake-up call we simply cannot ignore. Having been at this now for well over 40 years, I have long observed that people tend not to act until there is a real crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, that crisis has been with us for far too many years, decried, denigrated and denied. It is now rapidly becoming a comprehensive catastrophe that will dwarf the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. So climate change has the potential, he's saying, or, or is going to be much worse than the impact of coronavirus, dwarfing it effectively. Um, and I thought that was pretty powerful words from him. Yes, he's been campaigning on the environment for a very, very long time. That We were reminded, even in the, in the Sovereign Grant briefing we went to, it's 50 years since he first started <laughs> making speeches on the environment. And here he is sort of saying to us, we really do need to do something about this now. And kind of not forget coronavirus, but climate change is going to be much worse. Yeah, he says that we need to put ourselves on a warlike footing, approaching our action from the perspective of a military style campaign. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting how he said that uh, as humans, we are simply just not able to focus on the problem until it is right on top of us. Kind of how the whole world is adapting now with coronavirus, masks, social distancing, working from home. But when it comes to the environment, it's just 10 or 20 or 30 years away, so no one's actually focusing on it very much indeed. But we spoke to a scientist, didn't we, who uh, agreed with the prince and said, while coronavirus, of course, is uh, a huge problem right now and a very acute problem, it will hopefully not last as long as potentially climate change could and the damage that climate change could do long term. Our grandchildren will no doubt look back on what we do about climate change as much more important than what we do about COVID-19. Right now, there's no question that COVID-19 is a more acute problem but in the long term, the prince is quite right. And some good news to end then. Um, I mean, very serious warning uh, from, from Prince Charles. And actually, we know of some other things coming up on, on the environment and the royal family, which we can't tell you, uh, well, we will be able to tell you on next week's podcast. Uh, but some good news to end. Um, some lovely the Queen's news to end. got number nine grandchild, great grandchild on the way. Number nine, yep. Yeah. yeah, Princess Eugenie and Jack Brooksbank announced this morning um, that they are very pleased to announce yeah. that they're expecting without, a baby. Without looking, at, without looking at your notes, name <laughs> all other eight. Okay. Uh, George, Charlotte, Louis. Yeah, there's easy. Easy. Archie. Yep. Uh, Isla, Savannah. Yep. Mia, Lena. Well done. That's good. That's eight. Um, can you do them in order that they were born? Uh, I don't think we've got time for that. <laughs> or whether anyone's interested. In or whether anyone's um, But anyway, uh, this, is, uh, this is the Instagram post. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. If not, go on to our um, Instagram page at ITV News Royals and you'll see it on there. This is the Instagram post that Princess Eugenie put up to say that she was expecting a child. And um, uh, her mother um, 
Sarah, the Duchess of York, also tweeted earlier to say just how thrilled and excited she is. So uh, some lovely news. And a statement from Buckingham Palace. Yep. Which read, do you have it there? I don't have it on oh, you. Oh, you don't have it on you, so I'm going to have to read it because oh, I can so find it in time. I think it might can be you see it? my phone. <laughs> and can I see it is another very, very good question. And, oh, actually, while, while you do that, why didn't you talk about the leading names? Alice and Arthur are leading the betting at the moment, according to one bookie that emailed me earlier. Oh, okay. um, but the statement from Buckingham Palace, he says, popping on his specs, uh, <laughs> says Her Royal Highness Princess Eugenie and Mr Jack Brooksbank. Let me just... Uh, Turn up the brightness of my screen. I can't see it. I'm <laughs> laugh. Make the font laugh. That they are expecting a baby in early 2021. The Duke of York and Sarah, Duchess of York, Mr. and Mrs. George Brooksbank, the Queen, and the Duke of Edinburgh are, quote, delighted with the news. Yeah, lovely news, isn't and it? A, a very nice place to end. So, nine great grandchildren for the Queen. Uh, next week, we will put on the order in which they were born, unless actually you want to do the work for us and just put it on our Twitter. and. Uh, hashtag us, uh, Royal Rota ITV. Um, there's lots going on next week. We will tell you about it then. Yep. Uh, this has been a busy enough week, as you can see from the, the, the math stack of papers. Yeah, um, the math. And it's normally much thicker than that because we normally walk out of the palaces with the, a hard copy of everything, but it was all done online this week. Life is changing. I mean, changing. actually, you had um, people in the palace doing this Microsoft Teams briefing with us all at home. Some of the palace staff were in their homes. It was, uh, it's all changed. I mean, who'd have, who'd have known? But this time last year, we were in Cape Town. Actually, you were in Cape Town. I was in Cape Town and, and you were Harry. on your way we to Botswana. left on a plane. We, there were three private planes. Let's just, you know, private planes has been an issue before. There were three planes that were chartered. Harry, two for the press, and we were flying to Botswana and actually on our way to Angola, where we did that very, very important um, day on landmines uh, in honour of his mother who'd been there in 1997. So that was a busy time a year ago yeah. when they're all stuck where we are working from <laughs> home. So life has changed a lot in the past 12 months. Thanks uh, for continuing to listen and watch and we will see you next week.